Well, thanks, Richard. Uh, I should also point out I'm also a product of Guelph. And uh, for those of you, uh, there's going to be a Guelph alumni reunion at 5 p.m. Come early because it's going to be packed <laughs> at the bar. Uh, when I saw this man this morning, I thought, well, there's a guy with real sartorial splendor. The guy's either crazy or an academic. Take your pick. And, I, and then, I, then I was going to comment on that, and then I thought, listen to your presentation. You talked about fact-resistant humans. I like that. We have a lot of those in Alberta. They're called progressive conservatives, <laughs> now soon to be known as the regressive conservatives. Um, it's a privilege to be here. I want to thank uh, a couple of people first for making this possible. First to Cornelia and Guinea Bryach. I don't know, where, Guinea, where are you? Uh, they're the two people that are responsible for my being here. Uh, because they funded the work that I'm going to talk to you about. I want to just say thanks to Iris Mack and her crew who did such a great job organizing this event. I know they're in the background somewhere else. Uh, I don't see Iris. There's Iris, yes. Um, and, but I also want to thank uh, my colleague who can't be here today, uh, Bob Burden and Syracon, uh, because this truly was a collaborative project that we worked on. And Bob and I uh, share an interesting background. We met here in Alberta, uh, but we're both from dairy farms in Ontario. And I think we learned discipline. We also learned, shit, we don't want to live like this for the rest of our lives. So we fled the, fled the sector, even though we do a lot of work in the industry. And we both have a strong interest in, in sport. Bob has a strong background in cycling. Uh, my background is track. And, but together, we converged by serving on a, in the area of the triathlon. I chaired the Edmonton Triathlon Academy for a few years, and last year we hosted the World Championships in, in Edmonton for the triathlon, and Bob and I were on that board together. So, and both of us arrived at this consulting, this, this very unusual profession in a, in a very circuitous manner. I think it's a reflection of our, our curiosity, perhaps, and perhaps a dose of eccentricity. Uh, but here we are, and um, the project uh, I'm about to uh, speak about is uh, really a, a labor of, of love and a long-standing focus uh, professionally, because our firm, Tolman Bauman in particular, I was just thinking, you should, you should get a couple family members and form a call, firm called Yada, Yada, and Yada. I think that would be, I think that would be great. Um, we've, we've been working in this whole area of value-added and advancing uh, the food processing sector for more than 20 years. Uh, and so, uh, as you listen to my, my presentation today, you can come to one of two conclusions. Uh, we've either learned something along the way, or we don't know anything at all. And you could come to either conclusion. So, here we go. Um, and I'm going to start in an unconventional manner. This is like a Dostoevsky novel, Crime and Punishment, which is not a murder mystery, because the murder takes place in the first few pages, and the rest of it is all about why. Well, I'm going to start... By, with my conclusions. And if I can get this thing to work, that would even be better. So, these are the conclusions of our work. First of all, current approaches toward innovation and growth, particularly the food industry here in Alberta, are not working. Technology is not the limiting factor. And thirdly, if we seek success, if we want to grow this industry, we're going to have to do things differently. So now that I've given you my conclusions, I can wrap up my talk and uh, everybody can have a break early. But uh, so let's, let's get started. I'm going to come back to these conclusions throughout my presentation. So Cornelia and her group uh, contracted the Conference Board of Canada back in 2012, 2013 to review opportunities in the uh, Alberta food value-added sector. And they came up with this particular statement. Alberta's food business motivation to innovate is in many cases much less than motivation in BC and Quebec. This was a shocking statement. It was, in effect, a wake-up call, which begs the question, why? What's going on, and why would they come to this conclusion? And so, if you think about it, all great breakthroughs or innovations starts with a great question. When Isaac Newton was uh, 
retreating from the plague and sitting on an apple tree and got hit with an apple, he thought, is there a relationship between this falling apple and the motion of the earth and the moon? Led to the forming of the calculus, which guided us in terms of understanding the physical universe for a long time until a bunch of people around the early part of the last century said, there's something not quite right here. And there is so Albert Einstein's sitting in his study doing one of his famous thought experiments, and he thought about someone in a state of weightless, weightlessness and thinking, if we put that person in a box and pulled him and continued to accelerate, the weight that he feels, is there a relation between that feeling and gravitation? And sure enough, the principle of equivalency and the, the general theory of relativity. In a book uh, you, some of you may have read came out about 10 or 15 years ago by Jarrett Diamond, was, was uh, precipitated by a very simple question. He was unloading a cargo plane, I think it was somewhere in Papua New Guinea, and one of the locals said, why do you people have so much stuff? And it really was a question about Western civilization, and what was it about the West and the conditions that led to this incredible material productivity over the centuries? But this question shocked our system, because here we are, Alberta. How can this be? We are in this province thinking that we are the leaders of free spirits and entrepreneurialism. We have a can-do spirit, and yet this firm comes along and tells us within the food sector, we're not even average. We're at the bottom relative to our uh, provincial counterparts. And not only that, you know, we've focused on value-added and enhancing the sector now for more than 20 years. In fact, our firm was very much at the forefront in working with Alberta Agriculture in 1995 and came forward with the changing course, a value-added agri-food strategy, which resulted in the formation of AVAC, the Alberta Value-Added Corporation. At that time, and you'll see 2010 by 2010, those of you who've been around for a while will remember that mantra. That meant we're going to achieve a $20 billion value-added sector next to a $10 billion production sector by the year 2010. If you peel the layers back a little bit further, the original goal was 2005. Realized pretty quickly it wasn't going to happen by 2005, and it didn't happen by 2010 either. And so how have we done? Well, the reason why that number came about, and we did some comparatives, because that, at that time we looked at value added in other jurisdictions. We looked at it in Ontario and you saw the bar chart this morning and their ratio of value added to farm production is three to one. If you look at the Netherlands, the big agri-food powerhouse, their ratio was two to one. If you look at New Brunswick actually, and they were kind of an anomaly, their ratio was four to one. But if you think a little bit further, they happen to have a very large multinational company started there by the name of McCain's. And so we thought, well, two to one. How hard can that be? 2010. So how have we done? Well, back in 95, it was about six and six. Six billion farm production, six billion uh, food processing. Well, in 2014, it's about 12 and a half and 12 and a half. So the ratio hasn't changed at all. It's still one to one. And if you look a little bit closer, well, you could say, well, at least we've doubled. Good for us. Well, if you look a little closer, since 1995, our population has grown 34%. If you use a discount factor of 2% for inflation on that 12.5 billion, it factors down to a little over eight, so our, our discounted growth is actually 30%. And then if you look at how much the price of beef and pork has risen in the last year, in some cases almost doubled, uh, our real growth is probably less than 15%. So relative to our population growth and economic growth, we've gone backwards. So, first principle, there are no answers, just questions. If you don't learn anything more here today than all the dazzling technology and product opportunities, remember this, there are no answers, just questions. And what we're saying here is that in something as stubborn and as mysterious as this, you got to keep asking the questions. So, what did we do? Well, we asked a lot of questions. We talked to a lot of people. We talked to a lot of people in the food business, uh, observers of the food business, experts, and this is what we heard. 
Well, first and foremost, our industry, food and agriculture, is definitely second tier in Alberta. It, it's way down there relative to energy. It's sort of a forgotten afterthought. It's like the poor country cousin. It's, no one's excited about agriculture and food. And you can feel it. And I talked to some, some uh, very interesting research and academics today and who affirmed that difficulty in attracting students to work in the summertime. But all the, the usual uh, labor, huge issue, not only the availability, but the affordability, the cost of labor, uh, the fact that Alberta is a long way from market, so we're not immersed in the most current and dynamic markets such as Vancouver or Toronto or Montreal or Los Angeles. We're, we see that from a distance. Um, and quite frankly, if you want to get really blunt, the food business, from a business perspective, is not a very enticing business. It's a tough, tough business. And if you were going to choose something strategically, if you're an up-and-comer and landed on this planet or a young student at, at university who was going to go into business, the food business is not something you would be attracted to. Why? First of all, it's terribly competitive. The margins are tight and it's so easy to copy, and the competition in terms of the consolidation of the buyers is extraordinary. So this is, uh, but also I want to say something else. We have some successes. Uh, I listed them here, and you see them being flashed up here. Um, you're familiar with most, most of these. Some have been around longer, such as Heritage Foods and Big Rock Brewery, but in the last 10 years, we've seen Afexa, which was cold FX. We've seen the rise of such companies as Little Potato Company, Connect Connect, Kitchen Partners, Elias, Siwanit. But if you examine these companies who are arguably successful, there are two factors that are apparent. Number one, first, they are led, in many cases, founded by a very identifiable, specific, driven individual who exemplifies leadership and tenacity like you will find no, nowhere else. And two of them are in this room, Angela Santiago, who I think just slipped out. She arrived here a little earlier from Little Potato Company. Jeff Clark from Kitchen, Kitchen Partners, both gifted leaders, and they're integral to the success of these businesses. And secondly, in almost all cases, they have either developed a new product line or introduced a new product category that differentiates them clearly differentiates them. Thus, intense personal drive and differentiation are the key success factors with these, these, uh, these particular businesses. So given these observations and the, given there is success, uh, what are some of the deeper constraints? There are no answers, just questions. Well, I was saying we've got lots of, I should say also, there's lots of capacity around. We've got institutions, research, Ken and his group at Leduc, uh, uh, the various development funds, the, the Agriculture and Food Council, and it goes on in terms of the kinds of capacity that's in this province. So there's no lack of capacity. So what are the deeper constraints? Well, we identified two major ones. One is fundamentally what we call leadership and related capacity. Fundamentally, these people, the drivers and the leaders I've talked about and their teams, they're going flat out. They're absolutely going flat out to keep up with the growth. And take the case of Little Potato Company, and I wish Angela was in the room because I can't say enough about her. In the last six years, that business has grown tenfold. And it's, it's, it's poised to grow another tenfold. That's the kind of growth and she can share the numbers with, with you this, later this afternoon. But these people are going flat out. So all the ideas we're hearing here today, for example, Richard and uh, what we heard this morning from technologies and product opportunities and trends, you know what's going to happen? Everybody's going to go back and they're going to get totally immersed in their business and they're going to, oh man, that was a great conference, but they won't have the time or the capacity to do very much about it. The odd one might, but generally speaking, these businesses are going flat out. Which leads to the next point, the ability or willingness 
or conversely, the inability or the unwillingness to accept greater risk. Not only are these people going flat out, the business risk associated with expanding or expanding dramatically is high. And so despite the risk environment these successful businesses are in, they're managing that in a, in a known framework. Going beyond that is a challenge. And, and back to the uh, retail concentration, the cost of listing new products to simply look at new products to bring to the market, the cost of listing those with the major retailers is, is extraordinary. It's no small challenge to get those on the shelf. So if you could summarize this, uh, we heard this quote, and it probably says it all. There is no incentive to be in the food industry in Alberta. This is actual quote. I wrote it down. I can't remember who said it anymore. I've checked my notes. But it just, to me, capsulated the situation. There is no single vision for agriculture and food in the province. There hasn't been one, quite frankly, since uh, Minister Peskowski back in 95, 96. No critical mass. No centers or hubs. There's bits and bobs scattered. No appeal to be in that business. And what's more, while there are opportunities, the sector suffers from a severe brain drain. The best and the brightest are all attracted to the energy sector. So it's a classic case of what some of you may have uh, heard before of Dutch disease. The predominance of one sector is so overwhelming and dominant, it attracts all the resources away from others who need that kind of talent. So what then... So this is kind of the state of the industry to some extent. Some of you may challenge me and uh, say it's not all this, uh, this bad or, or, uh, or it's, 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 we're not this way, but the fact of the matter is the industry has not grown materially for 20 years. So there's something fundamentally going on. So the bottleneck is, 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 is this. There's a desire, and Cornelia will talk about desire to again get this sector go going and to get the sector growing, and I think she's talking 25 billion within the next 10 years. So heck with 20 billion, let's go for 25. We're at 12. So that's a doubling again. So what are the bottlenecks? What? Well, we would say they're again two. Those companies are sectors best placed and best suited to lead, and now we're talking exponential growth. We're not talking incremental, you know, two or three, four percent a year. We're talking 10, 15 percent, a doubling in, in six, seven years. In most cases, those who are best suited to grow are, in fact, maxed out. And it's hard to attract the managerial and the business talent to, in fact, enable that. And also, while startup operations are important, they're extremely high risk. And the chances of, of seeing significant industry growth relying totally on startups, totally new innovations, is small. So how do we address this? We think the solution comes down to a very strategic form of advocacy, and I'll explain what that means, a disruptive intervention for the agri-food industry that can provide the initiative and assist targeted operations, implement complementary technologies so you listen to all the possibilities that are out there and the markets and figure out what may be best for a particular company or opportunity. So back to my conclusions. The current approaches toward innovation and growth are not working. They're, in our view, they're peripheral, uh, they're well-intended, but they're not getting to the strategic core of the challenge. And we did uh, some mapping, uh, we borrowed from some work we did for the Agri-Food Council a few years, uh, about where various programs fit, and if you want to grow the, if you want to grow the industry, you need to be in the top left-hand corner. Uh, market growth and strategic, both in terms of internal, external factors. And you look at all the programs that are out there, they're typically in the product side, on the technical side, they're not in the growth and market development side. Angela, welcome back. I just made some nice comments about you. Uh, <laughs> and if you add to that what I call the alphabet soup of Alberta organizations, you start listing them, it's phenomenal. We've done a very good job in the last 20 years of building organizations and spending arguably a lot of energy sustaining those rather than focusing on the real task at hand, growing the industry. Now that probably will not go well for some people either. But uh, in the last two con conclusion, technology is not the limiting factor, it's enabling, it's not the limiting because technology is everywhere. And thirdly, if we seek success, we must do things differently. So again, back to principle two, 
Um, again, if you don't remember anything, remember this, success for the Alberta agri-food sector requires a different approach. That's the core message here. So what did we do? Well, we kind of looked over the fence. And we looked at a couple jurisdictions that are doing some things interesting in manner. And of course, you can't avoid looking at the Netherlands, and specifically an initiative called the Netherlands Food Valley. And it perhaps should be no surprise because the Netherlands is such a, what in my view, a, a living laboratory. And I'm a product of that. My parents are Dutch immigrants. But uh, nevertheless, uh, the, the one thing that strikes you about the Netherlands is, first of, first of all, how small it is. The land base in the Netherlands, all in, is 23,000 square kilometers. So when you're driving some of you back to Edmonton or some of you Calgarians who dare to go past Airdrie, I know it's a big step, just like Toronto can't get off that 400 corridor. Just imagine the land base starting at Didsbury, driving up to Edmonton, look over to Sundry on one side, Highway 21 on the other side, that's your entire land base. Everything in agriculture takes place on that land base. By the way, you've got 17 million people you look after living on that land base. You've got something like 1.5 million dairy cows compared to 70,000 in Alberta. 12 million pigs compared to one and a half. You've got a total output in the order of 26 billion euro or 40 billion dollars, so at least four times as much. You've got a total ag GDP in the order of 80 billion. And, you know, I called uh, collaboration in the Netherlands a bit, a bit of an oxymoron. We've got so many people living together, you can't help but collaborate because you're basically stepping on each other's toes. That's not true. But Agriculture is important in, 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 in the Netherlands. It's 10% of the GDP. It employs 600,000 people. Farmers are, are respected professionals. And that's one of the th shocks people like my parents experienced coming from a country like the Netherlands where agriculture and the farmer was typically a leader in the community to really coming to a society where agriculture was every, something that everyone wanted to get away from. That's changed, of course. But the, the Dutch, being very strategic and focused, are also very committed to aligning and developing. And uh, they were one of the first to actually bring together institutions. I visited there 20 years ago when we, when we did the value-added strategy, and they were just starting to bring together various technical institutions and research institutions to build powerhouses. And, and they're very committed to inextricable linkages between industry, research, an applied technology institution. In 2004, they formed what was called the Food Valley, Netherlands, funded jointly by business and government to matchmake. Now, you would think anybody who doesn't need matchmaking, here are the Dutch, are matchmaking. And the purpose of the matchmaking are skilled individuals to bring together business and research institutes in goal-oriented clusters, assist product, project startups with proposals and to secure funding, and to match domestic and foreign companies with relevant businesses and research. So a very proactive matchmaking. Then we move to Scotland. We all know Scotland has a reputation to have the worst diet in the history of humanity. Fried Mars bar, served with a modicum of french fries, a, a diet void of vegetables. Uh, all these Scottish men run around chasing footballs and drinking beer. But they also have a large food processing industry. It's about 15 billion Canadian equivalent, so it's a bit bigger than our industry, 500 companies. And they made the commitment to improve two things, improve health and to grow their industry. And they, were, they did so by forming what's called the Food Health Initiative, Scotland, with two components, technical support and marketing support. And at the operational level, interestingly enough, the intervention they chose was working with a very specialized food industry consulting firm populated by people who understand the food industry, our food industry specialists, to in turn work with food companies to help grow their businesses. Again, a strategic uh, disruptive intervention. The approach, once an assessment is made of the opportunities for that company, the firm embeds expertise within the company in a very hands-on approach. Now, third example. Bob Burden came to me one day, he says, I've got it. I think I've got it, the model of innovation. I says, 
He says, DARPA. I says, what the heck's DARPA? And all of you are probably saying the same thing because probably you've never heard of the term. It's actually the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency embedded in the U.S. military, in the Pentagon. If you do a Google inquiry and, and start inquiring about innovation, DARPA may come up. It was founded in 1958, post the launch of the Sputnik. And the Americans realized, holy smokes, there's a technology out there that's very dangerous. And they decided we, there are three fundamentals we need to focus on. Get into space, detect nuclear explosions, and protect ourselves from nuclear ta attacks. That was the focus of DARPA. And the irony, of course, is that by the very virtue of its secret mission and the very fact that it's focused on military and defense initiatives, it's not that well known. But the outcomes and the spin-offs and the technologies that have resulted are astonishing. The internet is a product of thinking through nuclear explosion. If it wipes out a certain capacity with a satellite base, how do we make sure that we can continue to track? That was the basic structure that led to the internet. Now, Al Gore claims he may have invented the internet. I suspect he might have been on a Senate committee that approved funding for that initiative. That's why he makes that claim. Most people don't understand that. But every surveillance technology, IT protocols, global positioning, uh, unmanned vehicles, translation technologies, and all that manifested through our world of electronics and IT will find its roots in DARPA. And it's an astonishing array of discovery, and arguably the most successful innovation engine in the past 50 years. Why? Well, they put together a capacity to do some of the things that Dr. Yada spoke about through a bunch of technologies at you, and you're going, holy smokes, what, what, what could fit for me? What works for me? Focusing on sourcing complementary strategic technologies and led by an advocate capacity, skilled technical or skilled leadership individuals who worked on very focused projects, worked with assembling the players, whether it be research, whether it's academic, whether it's public or commercial, to really sharpen the focus to put together the necessary processes to build the business plan and execute that plan, and then to facilitate those partnerships. So if you look at and break it down, what makes DARPA successful? Well, first of all, very clear objectives. That's probably the singular most important process about being really clear what's to be accomplished. And then assembling a body of skilled, we call them scouts, they're referred to as scouts, highly skilled and motivated scouts that actually then are charged with a mandate to reach to meet those objectives. And part of that mandate then of identifying who has the technologies and the capacity to make this work. The pursuit is relentless because time frames are absolutely critical and obviously they had a budget because of that, and a mandate, the, the ability to assemble the right players, the companies, researchers, enablers, within a framework and a very flat organization. It's really interesting, and I don't pretend to know a lot about DARPA. But they have a very flat organizational structure, and the turnover is high because they attract people who are highly motivated that typically find business opportunities in the very places that they're working. They move on, and so to work for DARPA, for those that are coming out of business or science or technology, it's a desirable place to work because it's a stepping stone to success. And the other thing about DARPA, the contracts are very flexible. It's not your atypical, or I should say your typical government contracts, which are very binding and restrictive. A great deal of flexibility to allow commercial spin-offs and, and, and the actual commercialization of IP. So this is where I introduce principle number three, one of my favorite. Supply creates its own demand. Now, Richard touched on this a bit when he mentioned about supply, research, science, developing things to which, hey, didn't know that existed. Of course, this is my mantra. I'm in a business, if I don't get out there and make stuff happen, nothing happens. So I have to create a demand for my service. But we're not talking about commodity. We're talking about a different kind of supply. We're talking about a supply of capacity, 
capability, strategic focus, and necessary tools to achieve outcomes. So what needs to be done? Back to the Alberta food processing industry. We need to support and focus target opportunities and companies. We've, we've got a shopping list. We kind of haven't know where the markets are growing and what we're good at. We know about technologies, we know about trends. What are we going to do? Support and focus a few of those things and do it well. We need third party resources to take the initiative on proposing options and building business cases working in an embedded structure or fashion with companies capable both in terms of the capacity of their market or product line to grow, but also with a managerial team and a leader that wants to grow, and reduce the risk by developing the necessary financial and governance structures. So, if we talk about an advocate community, specifically with the Alberta food processing sector, it would work something like this, identifying opportunities and identifying those companies that have the opportunity to grow ex exponentially. So if I take Angela's company, for example, which has grown tenfold in the last six, seven years, and has the opportunity to grow another tenfold in the next four or five years, that's the kind of company. Because if you can get ten companies each between 250 and 500 million a year, suddenly you've increased your output by two and a half billion to five billion. And that's the way we have to think. And I'm, Jeff, I don't know what your company, and I don't your numbers, but I suspect you're doing something very special on the food service side. If you had the resource and the capacity, you could grow that business tremendously, particularly in the U.S. market, where Angela's business will be growing as well. Uh, be embedded. I've talked about that. Uh, have very detailed knowledge of largely embedded in the food industry, but understanding technology, understanding the markets, and then learning the client's business inside out because there's no one fits all solution. You have to develop solutions specific to the company and it may be a growth opportunity, it may be a cost savings opportunity and then once it's decided developing that business case, getting the buy-in, then sourcing the solutions, the technologies, the enabling mechanisms and organizations to make that happen and establishing effective implementations teams. So with that, introducing the Food Research Projects Framework, which is our contribution to innovation. It's modeled after DARPA. First comment I'll make, I'm not sure if it's got the right name, but it's still conceptual. And it has three critical components. Uh, it has a innovation targeting team, and this is uh, a bit of, and I won't dwell on this, uh, uh, this, this is where Bob Burden was going to take over, so you could blame these slides on Bob. Uh, but uh, an innovation targeting team, which, or the secretariat, which sets the direction with the mandate to grow uh, specific companies or segments or sectors in the industry. A market intelligence team that really seeks out the opportunities from a marketing perspective as to where that takes place. These are the scouts. And then a financial integration team. So if you look, uh, these are the three components I've just talked about. Uh, and then if you look at how the process uh, works, it really starts to look at what's possible, um, uh, where is the growth going to happen, how are we going to do that, and, and we go through a sequence of uh, assessing that, pulling together the marketing assessment uh, combined with the financials, and ultimately all pulls together like this. So lots of detail here, but I think conceptually I just want to make the point uh, there is the really key components, that mandate and fundamental targeting team, the market intelligence team, and the financial integration team. So what makes it different than what we've done so far in this province? Well, first of all, it's built on capability and proactivity. Getting the right people, led by a director with a vision and a mandate. It's focused on the market. What do we want to accomplish? Where's the growth? And what are the companies that can really grow with the right kind of uh, management teams and abilities and structures, not technology? And it's flexible in terms of the financial structure, because this is where the, 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 the bottleneck often comes. How do you finance gr growth? So you have to go through the whole process. What is required? What are the options, both in types and structure? And putting it together, including the financial incentives for the scouts, because you want to motivate them. They don't become 
permanent employees, they become incented employees on a set time frame, working on a contractual basis with the ability to actually uh, benefit th through their efforts. And that's what motivates them. That's what makes DARPA successful. That has the potential to make this successful. So to summarize then, it brings together three essentials. Leadership and commitment, and I can't say enough about the commitment that needs to be at place, and quite frankly, this is where it really begins. And maybe under the new regime that's taking place now, uh, all this talk we've had about diversifying the economy and supporting agriculture and supporting the food industry, maybe the time has come to say we've got to get serious and we've got to get things done differently. In, it involves scouts, very qualified, motivated individuals who become embedded in a selected group or a select number, a handful of companies with the potential to grow and supported by enabling agents, predominantly financial, to make this happen. So are we finished? No. This is really a beginning. It's a conceptual. And as I was saying to uh, Cornelia earlier today, if I look at uh, our challenge within the food industry here in Alberta, it's no different than almost every other sector in our failure to really develop a diversified economy, and arguably this could be a strategy for the province in very specific sectors, forestry, IT, health sciences, are a couple areas that come to mind. So let me, uh, and in terms of next steps, this has to be developed further in terms of a more detailed business case to really define the structure, um, to really identify who are some of the players that can make this work. And of course, the most important one is the commitment on the part of an agency such as Alberta Innovates Biosolutions and or your minister or the government to say, yes, we need to do something serious here. So there's, there's some serious things that need to happen. Uh, so let me just conclude uh, with, with one quote on commitment, and I'm going to quote uh, a German uh, writer, Goethe, G-O-E-T-H-E, who says, there is one truth. The moment one commits, then all providence moves. So the message is that we need to commit to seriously build this industry in a way that can move it forward. Do we have all the answers? No, not at all. But hopefully we've asked some of the deeper questions and have pointed to some directions that we talked about here today that will help lead us to some answers and hopefully better outcomes for this industry which has so much potential uh, and is underperforming. Thanks for this opportunity.